Uh, so yeah, uh, hello. Thanks everyone for coming out to learn about pass keys with us. Uh, I guess I will be your moderator tonight. I am Starchy Grant. I work on the tech ops team at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And uh, with me are uh, my co-panelists who will introduce themselves now. <laughs> All right, I will not move the microphone quite there. Hopefully it will stay quiet. Uh, my name is Andrew Hirsch. I'm a professor of computer science at the University at Buffalo, uh, which is the, one of the, the flagship SUNY school, uh, where I teach and research programming languages and security. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Xavier Ash. I am a security industry pro. I work in the banking industry, uh, some purple bank that you know you might know. And uh, I've uh, been in the uh, the scene for a little while. I've been hacking since the 80s uh, in information security since the 90s. Yes, that was a little gap there. Uh, we forget about that. It was, it was before uh, the time of, of what was it the, the uh, Laws that that and is it quiet in the back? Okay. Anyway, uh, so and uh, so yeah, I've um, been hack hacking since the '80s. You know, been in security since the '90s, and um, you know, I'm I'm here to kind of represent you know kind of the enterprise side of it. We're gonna try to gather. You know, we've kind of pulled a few of you in the room to kind of figure out who what audience we're gonna hit, and we've got a lot of different people. So uh, so I hopefully will help me an answer some of the uh, enterprise questions, and and uh, so yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, so uh, as Xavier said, we're we're assuming that there's a pretty good range of knowledge and backgrounds in the room. So uh, why don't we just start with the basics and make sure that we're all on the same page? Um, what is a passkey? So I'll start with with this. Um, so when we talk about computer security, there's three large aspects that we often talk about that sometimes are called the golden rule of security. Uh, authorization, authentication, and audit. If you know your periodic table, you might be able to guess why it's called the golden rule. Um, so passkeys are all about authentication. Authentication is, are you who you say you are? A passkey is some token, usually a physical device, that you have that possessing that device shows that you are who you say you are. So I actually carry on my keys a Yubi key. This is a passkey. By having this inserted in my computer, the computer knows that my keys are there. Since I'm the one who carried my keys around with me, I am who I say I am. Same way that a password, you have memorized this secret phrase. If you present that phrase, it's evidence that you are who you say you are. And and as as we've evolved the password and the security of that, right? We we started to realize, hey, something you know isn't good enough, right? Because something you know could be something could be guessed, right? Because we want something that we know to be easy to guess, because it's something up here, and we can't you know unlock all that and and come up with a complex password. So we end up having different ways of being able to memorize the something you know. So then we introduced what we called multi-factor, right? So we said, all right, something you know isn't good enough. If we're going to go something secure, we need to do something else. We're going to need some other factor. So then we have the uh, something you have. And the something you have is, you know, what could be something physical. If, uh, if any of you guys worked in government or banking for a long years, you may have had a pass card for a while, something that you actually stick in, like you said, stick into the machine, all right? That is not a pass key. All right, so we're getting we're eventually going to get to a pass key, but right now we're talking about just a nut. This was a smart card that had an authentication token on it and it just basically gave you that multi factor. And I have something I know that that is represents the authentication, right? Are you the person that you say you are? And then the you know, do you have authorizations? Like I've got this card that was given me to my, my, my government or my company, and now I've got the other factor. Other factors have, have evolved over time, and everybody has dealt with the SMS multi-factor code, right? And that is a uh, another step up to be able to deliver that multi-factor over another network. So you have the uh, some way of being able to say, how can we give you a something you know in real time that we can help trust that you that it is you, right? I've got the something you know, something you have, and put those multi-factors together. And, and as that has developed, 
unfortunately, hackers have, have evolved and figured out ways of stealing the the the, the multi-factor. Uh, and and with SMS is one of those that is a very common way. Most websites nowadays that have multi-factor have SMS. But then the way that you steal that is that you can just steal the phone. Physically steal the phone or what we call uh, SIM swapping, right? Where you come and take take somebody's phone number, swip the, stop, swap the SIM back. <laughs> and then you can do the text, uh, get, that, get that text message and then be able to take over an account. So we've had to move, step it up from there. So next evolution you want to talk about how we get to Pesky's? Yeah, so uh, one thing that I think uh, gets gets a bit confusing in this conversation that I think uh, we already um, touched on a little bit is the, the difference between a hardware authenticator uh, like, um, like a smart card or a YubiKey and what we're talking about tonight the the passkey. A passkey can live on a hardware token like a YubiKey, but it's actually something new. Uh, it's not two-factor authentication, but it includes two-factor authentication, uh, and it totally replaces your your password as well. Um, so what happens when you set up a passkey? Uh, is you have to already be signed into uh, authenticated to a website. And what will happen is your device, maybe your smartphone, your laptop, or a password manager that you're signed into will then create a public and private key pair, um, register it with that specific domain name. Uh, this means it can't be used for any other domain name if, for example, somebody sends you a very convincing email that just happens to look exactly like an email from your bank, uh, but sends you to a different login page. That won't work with a passkey. Um, and then one of the ways that you can take care of that passkey and make sure you don't lose it is to store it on YubiKey that Andrew just showed you. But um, I, was, I was wondering if, if maybe we, we, we could talk a little bit more about why this is necessary, right? So we have password managers. We have things like YubiKeys for second factor authentication. Um, and anytime we log into uh, or, or set up a new account on a website, it tells us that we have to include a different symbol and a number and our favorite color of Nyan cat in our, the password that we're creating. Um, why, why aren't passwords good enough? Passwords aren't good enough because people aren't good at passwords. Um, in, in all seriousness, passwords are, are uh, to, to be uh, maybe a bit exaggerated, passwords are almost designed to be good for hackers and bad for humans, right? Passwords are a few bits of information right? Because they're generally short, somewhere like eight to 10 characters, and they're usually constrained. So if I'm a hacker and I'm trying to figure out what is the possible password, there's not a lot of degrees of freedom. I can guess some things and I know that a lot of possible guesses aren't actually possible. So that means I have to make way fewer guesses, right? Um, there, are some, there are some ways around this. So for instance, you can try to use some tricks to generate better passwords that are easier for humans to remember and also harder to guess because they have they're longer right but a lot of systems won't let you use those sorts of passwords they insist that you have a number and a symbol and once you start doing that or worse they say oh yes you have to change your password once a month well guess what that does it incentivizes everybody to start writing down their passwords or start or worse start storing their passwords on some like i don't know dropbox or something <laughs> A password manager will help a lot with this because a password manager at least stores those in an encrypted space. But now there's still a master password that, if guessed, gives up people access to all of your passwords. So it's still making uh, a big security compromise potential there. Uh, and they do get hacked. I mean, 
several of them have been big news that they've been hacked recently. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so you think about password managers versus this passkey thing and you're trying to figure out what's the difference, right? What's the big, like, is, is, is passkey things, is it YubiKey, is this the same thing as a password manager? So we think of the, what the, what, one of the evolutions of technology allowed us to, to do this has been what's called a, a trusted protected module or TPM. And uh, if, does anybody here have an older PC and they've tried to upgrade to Windows 11 and it says your computer does not support Windows 11, right? Yeah, I see a few of you nodding, right? All right, yeah. We all, old. It, it, it's really, so the reason for that is, and one of the reasons for that, there's lots of different requirements that Windows 11 has, but one of them has been a specific version of this TPM so that Windows Hello, which is the uh, one of the ways that Microsoft is implementing this, this, this uh, technology, is is being able to store that so we think about he's got a yubi key okay we've got phones and then we've got computers these all have these are all different implementations of that tpm module and so that allows us to then like you said it's two factor <coughs> combined together so when you create that passkey you've got information about the uh about the website or application that you're going to use it with you've already been authenticated so we've got identity and then we've got the device and the device itself and there's magic encryption all happens there, big math there, that then gets stored in that TPM chip. Okay, now that secret, and that, that, that magic thing that is going to unlock you is in that TPM. So if you create a passkey on your, on your phone, that is different than a passkey that you would create on your laptop. So think about when you're saying, I am now trusting that my phone, I've got a secret uh, uh, storage here on my phone, TPM, that keeps a secret here, and that's going to help me log in. That is different than a password manager. A password manager is a software that is just storing your password in a so in software that could or could not be secure. Right? There's one password, there's, there's, there's password managers that run locally, there's one password manager that run in the cloud, but all that's doing is, is storing your password in, in what you hope is a software-based solution that will keep you secure. Unfortunately, like you mentioned, not all password managers are perfect. Software gets hacked all the time. So it, that's one of the, the evolutions of technologies allowed us to get to this passkey is having that TPM chip allows you to, 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 store, to securely store that, but it is physically in a device. Such math, very big. Such math. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I will mention, um, these sorts of like, oh, people wrote down their password problems are really big problems. Um, there is a story, RSA, uh, which is a security uh, protocol, but it's also a security firm run by the same people. Uh, they had, they actually were making uh, trusted hardware, uh, and they had a big breach. And this breach happened when somebody did the moral equivalent of calling up and saying, hi, I'm the password inspector. I'm here to inspect your passwords. <laughs> and somebody said, oh, yeah, I have a big list of them written down somewhere. Yeah, that was one of the first evolutions of the, the secure multi-factor. If, uh, if anybody carried around a little uh, uh, RSA fob that had a little a number that changed everyone, the magic math behind that is you start off with a magic number, and then it, you start with a date, and then you can then calculate the number uh, based on basically that magic number and, and the date that it was created. The magic number is what got stolen by hackers, mm -hmm. and so then they were able to then create the numbers for everybody's, and this included uh, government contractors. Everything was a mess, so that helped us learn how to create TPM. So the TPM modules learned the lessons of RSA and restructured. And we talked about you know now our modern infrastructure we're mostly hitting websites, right? So that's why it includes the domain name, so that nobody you know and we we're, phishing is the biggest problem, right? People tricking us into giving away the what you know, and or hacking our systems and then stealing it from our systems. And so the TPM is is that evolution of being able to say, hey, we need a place, a better way to be able to store this. So let's say that I've got my TPM. I've used it. Uh, you know, it's on it's on my phone or my laptop. I've used it to create a pass key to let me into the website that that completely rules rules my life, where I, I do all my communication. It, it, it you know, it's my whole social calendar. It, it's 
if everything I care about goes through this website, let's say it's something like dragoncon.org, um, then I, I drop my phone in the toilet or leave it in, a, in an Uber or, you know, my laptop dies because, you know, they, they, they never last more than two years anymore. Um, what then? I mean, in general, there's a, this is a, a, a more general version of the problem, which is just if I've lost the ability to authenticate, I need to reestablish authentication that so that I can reestablish that trust. So if you work with security people for a while, you realize that we talk about a few things just all the time. Trust is one of them, right? Establishing trust is like the name of the game. Uh, so you need to reestablish that trust so that you can create a new to uh, a new uh, passkey or a new password or whatever it is. I mean, this also happens when you lose your password, when you forget your password and you have to go create a new password, right? They do something else that's more expensive than typing in your password, usually sending you an email or something, to try to reestablish that authentication. Now, emails have, using emails for this, of course, has their own problems. But either way, you need to use something else that's probably going to be more expensive than just plugging in your passkey or whatever. And you need to know that this is going to be able to reestablish that trust and allow you to establish a new passkey. And, and that is going to be the, uh, you know, the, the Achilles heel of most security systems is generally going to be as we get a better lock on the front door, right? We've got to check the windows and the back door and everything like that. And how do you go and change your locks? And that's, that's exactly what we're talking about here. And so uh, one thing to remember with pass keys is that it is tied to a device. It is the combination of your identity, your password and a, a device identity combined together. And so you have to think about that when you're setting things up. So then, so that when you do change your phone, lose your phone, get it stolen, uh, that you've got a way to securely get that back. And so that is, you know, your back door that you need to then secure. So if it's a email address, is that going to be a, the same email address that you use for, you know, uh, the, the adult websites that you log into? Is that a good idea to be, you know, uh, sharing that path with other less secure means, right? So always talk to small businesses, people that are worried about uh, security is, is to, you know, segment your life, right? If you're doing banking, if you're transferring money, if you've got your Quicken, you've got your where you do your banking, where you, you know, where you keep up with all that, especially for small businesses, get an old laptop that's just there and that's the only thing that you do on it. Right. Same thing goes for these backdoor, uh, you know, ways of, of resetting your pass keys and passwords. Make sure that it is segmented away from the rest of your life so that it's a little bit more secure. So if I'm hearing this right, porn, most secure banking, almost as secure. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Um, so uh, I, I think. Uh, both both of you have some experience um, in in the enterprise um, with uh, with handling authentication for uh, large user base. Um, let, let's talk about what that looks like for pass keys. What what um, what's this the experience like if you either are managing pass keys for uh, business users, or if you have a business uh, administrator managing them for you, I'm actually going to defer. <laughs> sure. To more than I do. Yeah, and also wanted to throw in another word uh, that uh, get gets thrown around a lot, especially in the, when we want to start talking in the past, uh, the um, in the enterprise space. Is everybody wants to talk about passwordless, right? And passwordless generally can mean a lot of different things, right? You know, if you think about your password manager, it's kind of passwordless, right? I just it just puts me in, right? Fills it in for me, but it what the real technical meaning of uh, passwordless is getting to a passkey system where that uh, there are certain situations where I can then just push a button on my phone, you know, uh, respond to a, a pop up, you know, in a code is is this this interactive. So let me, let's walk through it. <coughs> so uh, the um, the enterprise level uh, conglomeration of this is called FIDO, F-I-D-O. And I think we're on FIDO2 now. And so the FIDO2 uh, specification basically says you've got to do a couple of things uh, and, and implement way implement these different ways. And uh, the uh, Microsoft's uh, version of that is Windows Hello. 
uh, if you've got your own PC and you've turned the little camera thing on or you've got, you know, the thumb swipe, you might have already enabled Windows Hello on a personal device or you may have worked for a company that has already started to roll that out. That's also what Microsoft calls passwordless. So passwordless to Microsoft and Cisco and all the other, uh, you know, big shops means FIDO2. And, and uh, part of that is being able to support this, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, at an enterprise level, like how you distribute, how do you manage the whole life cycle of that within an enterprise. And so, um, so the, the, uh, with, if you, we go walk through that same steps where we say, hey, I've got this, this secret, uh, there's something I know, so I've got an identity, and then I tie that to a PC uh, the, uh, or, or in some type of endpoint, right? I can also manage that endpoint from a you know a, a cloud, and then be able to push and manage those identities directly from that that those devices. So now I've got device identities, I've got people identities, and then I've got the combination. I've got these pass keys that I've got to then manage, and you can do that at an enterprise level. And 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 like I said, Microsoft kind of made that easy for us. Uh, but the technology is picking up. So uh, uh, for example. You know, not a whole lot of laptops uh, necessarily have the little thumbprint. Uh, also, the uh, the camera that's required for FIDO2 has to have the little IR sensor so that you can then make sure it's not just a picture of somebody. So it's so if you have a FIDO2 compliant, you know, you're you're actually doing it and you can try it. This is a fun trick is a print your print your face out and see if you can unlock your phone or your uh, or your laptop. And if you can, that means it's it's an older technology and it's not as secure. Uh, you know, and so it, it's one of these uh, that that allows us to then um, uh, to, to roll this out. But the fun is always in enterprises is that logging into your PC is only the first step. Then you've got your hundreds of other apps that you've got to log into. So the, I always call it the passwordless journey, right? And and so I'm you know with with my day job, we are on that journey. We've done you know a lot of the front end, uh, but there's a whole lot that we've got to you know shore up, and we and we and we try to figure out where our hacker is going to come at us. Where do we need to secure those? Um, but in in general, that that's that's the that's the general approach. Is is uh, you know um, um, Microsoft's built that in. Uh, uh, IBM also has some solutions. All the big you know technologies have those uh, FIDO2 compliant. Uh, but yeah, if you're interested in that, if you want to start building that into like if you have an app, you run a website, uh, you know you know search for FIDO2 compliant modules so that you can start uh, you know interacting in this uh, with your customers this way. Great. So. Um... And forgive me, I totally forgot to uh, mention this at the beginning, but if anybody does have any burning questions, please feel free to run up to the uh, the mic in the center aisle, and uh, we'll also save some time at the end of the presentation for questions then. Um, so on that note, um, is it possible to have more than one pass key for the same service? Like say for example a, a work email and a personal email on the same device, and what does that look like for the user? I mean, in theory, it's completely possible. I mean, there's nothing that says I can't say until you've given me both pass keys, or if you've given me either of these pass keys, I'll let you in, right? Or until you've given me both, I won't. Uh, I don't know of any services that set that up. Um, I don't know that it would actually add a lot of security. And this is where you start having to to throw around another word that a lot of us in the security community like to throw around, which is your threat model. What is the threat model where having two pass keys is better than just having one? And I'm not saying there aren't any. I'm saying that they're probably pretty darn rare. <laughs> um, you know, uh, if what we're concerned about are essentially Russian troll, troll farms, which for a good portion of us, that's what we're concerned about. Or I work at a university, right? What we're concerned about are parents hacking in to see their kids' grades. <laughs> a surprisingly common like thing that people want to do uh, is see their adult children's grades. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, I know. Um, it, 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 on the one hand, it seems not that amazing. On the other hand, it is against the law. <laughs> it's against the law for us to tell them. Uh, and we... I don't think that having two of these is going to help. Well, I, I think that there's another perspective. We'll get the other. Yeah, well, there's another perspective here is that, you know, it used to be when you go into work, you use completely different technology than you do at home. Now everything's in the cloud and everybody's on like Microsoft 365. And so you might be have a personal version of Microsoft 365 and then an office version of 365. 
So in this scenario, it is, you know, it's up to the company and figuring out how to implement that and, and what, you know, where you allow authentications from. I work for banks, so we're kind of sensitive about that, right? We're on the high end of that. And if you work for a, a company that, you know, helps, uh, you know, clean, clean bathrooms here, right? That's going to be a different model. But you still want to be able to manage it so that you're not, uh, you know, allowing that that cross pollination between the personal, you know, uh, OneDrive and your work OneDrive, so you don't accidentally copy that, you know, from back and forth. Um, most like on on mobile devices, there is, uh, you know, both Apple and and Android have built in a sandboxing feature that allows for the uh, your work apps to be separate from your your um, your home apps. That is also true in the TPM. So that also uh, allows you to then when you go to Office 365, that is going to be the same domain name, right, for uh, logging in personal versus. And so you want to be able to grab the right uh, uh, pass key. And in that case, it is whichever instance of Outlook or, uh, or, or the browser or whatever you launch. Uh, once you're inside of your work sandbox, you can get to your sandboxed TPM stored pass keys. As soon as you launch your personal browser that just went to that adult website, you cannot access your work uh, TPM uh, 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 secrets. And so that sandbox has actually been fairly stable. Uh, I always, I, I'm really interested in this because, you know, uh, we've got a lot of insecurity. There are a lot of technology companies that are, you know, next big thing. They want to make, you know, lots of startups in this space and, and, and mobile security seems really fun. But the, the thing is, is that that sandbox has been pretty solid for a while. I'm, I expect us to see some sandbox escapes in, on the mobile platform. You know, we're going to start seeing those in the next couple of years. But, they're, you know, both Apple and at least Pixel devices uh, are, are patched in, in, a, in a timely manner. And so if those come up, those will probably be pretty secure. But Actually, that's generally... the biggest place where that's coming up yep. right now, and it is coming up, is Amazon. Okay. AWS. You have, uh, so AWS, if you're not familiar, Amazon Web Services allows you to basically spread, uh, spin up a bunch of virtual machines, a bunch of virtual computers in the cloud. Almost everybody that runs a website for uh, business these days does it on AWS because then you don't have to worry about, oh, what if a <laughs> sudden spike of traffic comes in? Uh, you know, I just spin up more computers. It's fine. The big problem is it's not like they have a separate computer for every virtual machine. The, uh, the same physical device is running a lot of these things. How do they do that? With sandboxing. And they are extremely concerned because Amazon now makes the majority of their money on AWS. They're extremely concerned about this. And there's a lot of work using what's called formal methods, which is something I'm, I'm an expert in, uh, where you try to prove that it is impossible for certain types. And I have to be very clear here, we can't prove that there is no that, that this thing is absolutely secure right that's not a, a real mathematical statement we can prove we can prove that certain types of sandbox escapes are not possible and this is something that's very very hot right now uh because of aws and i suspect it will come to iphone and android too for exactly the same reason absolutely great um yeah so um on that note, uh, what what kind of uh, challenges are we seeing uh, to the adoption of pass keys? And for for the early adopters, what challenges might be run into trying to use them? I mean, one of the biggest challenges is a social one, right? Mm -hmm. um, a, a nice to both to some degree, a legal one, uh, although. Uh, I guess we don't have a lawyer up here, so we can't. We, uh, oftentimes, when I'm on EFF panels, we have somebody who can talk about the legal side more expertly than I can. I, I can talk about it, but do not listen to anything I say. There we go. <laughs> uh, I should I should have given that uh, statement too. Yeah, I'm, I'm just completely making it all up. So, but uh, a, a big issue that we have right now is that, especially in the enterprise level, it's more important to be seen as doing the normal thing than it is to be seen doing the secure thing. Mm -hmm. And right now, passwords are the normal thing. And it is very hard when we've built up this big infrastructure around passwords to get to, uh, enterprises to move. And as a user who wants to use uh, pass keys, things like GitHub have set them up because they're made for nerds. And they know that they're, they have a lot of security nerds who want to do things like that. And I use a pass key to get into GitHub. 
but a huge portion of services just don't offer that option to me as a random user. Well, you know, I, I'm starting to see it. I just, uh, you know, got a new phone, so I'm going through this device, you know, trying to, you know, re-authenticate and get all this stuff set up. Uh, and Amazon asked me, there's a right below, create, you know, log in password or, or create a passkey. And I was just like, oh, cool. Hey, look, I'm just going to talk about this. So hey, this is, the, the, you know, just regular Amazon, you know, buying crap, right? So um, uh, I think one of the challenges to passkeys is going to be the knowledge of what they are, right? And, and that they're tied to a specific device. And that's the biggest key I'm trying to get out to consumers and people that are not technically savvy is that the passkey is my password plus the magic math on here and it's stored here. And, 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 uh, and so that is, uh, you know, a concept. And, and so since they didn't know if I was a geek or not, you know, they, they're already pushing consumers to start using passkeys. It's going to be upon some of us, you know, as, as all of us, if you're technical, you know you're the guy or person that people come to to ask the questions, right? They're gonna say, "What is this passkey thing on Amazon? What do I need to use this?" And like, and, you know, so we'll have to go and and start getting the word out on being able to help people figure out how to navigate this. And if you're in this room, you're one of those people who's going to be helping us get that word out. <laughs> so Xavier said, "Yeah." Um, I I also wanted to kind of go through the story. I so we work for bank and and being a security in the bank, you know, people all I'll go to security events. And I get the question all the time, hey, I've got this newfangled, you know, newbie key. I've got this, you know, multi-factor. I've got this, uh, you know, using authenticator. I've got, you know, this new way that is more secure. Why aren't, why don't you allow me to use this at the bank where I think that that is the most important place to do it? And, and it is really interesting to try to look at the range of consumers that we have at a consumer bank and try to figure out what technology we add in and how can we make it as frictionless as possible. And so what we've actually been doing for years now is that there are some really behind the scenes uh, math that goes on and trying to figure out, you know, uh, are you who you are, both from a uh, just getting in the front door, but even once you're in the system, navigating, transferring money, doing different things, there are fraud checks at every step. And so in general, and we also have ways of rolling things back. So if you do, you know, you have federal protections, if you're working for, if you have your money and you're doing stuff with a real bank uh, and not uh, one of the, uh, the new uh, fintechs, right? You, uh, you, you can call up and say, hey, I gave my password out to this guy and they've cleaned me out and or I see these transactions and the, I didn't do these, right? Somebody stole my card. You can, you know, if you, you follow the process, you get that money back. So it's one of these where, you know, we've got different ways to be able to secure it. And even if you, if we screw up, we can, we can, we can back it out. But of course we've always, you know, got, and so we are, in, you know, have introduced passwordless, but we did skip a step. We didn't add the YubiKey. We didn't add the, you know, Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator. And the reason is, is that that is a very small fraction. And even though it'd be really great for us people that know how to use Google Authenticator and been using it for years, uh, you know, that is a still a very small number. And to be able to support that would confuse the heck out of everyone else. They're like, what's this Google? What, why do I have to go download an authenticator? Right? So we eventually, you know, built that technology into our app. And then, uh, now we've got TPM and now we can sit there and, and, and integrate that in and know, Hey, this is this person from this phone. And, and as soon as you pull up the app and, and you're, you're already authenticated to a certain level and then you can adjust that authentication so you go in through the app you can probably look at your balances without even you know you know putting in a password or even putting your thumbprint in right you can actually see your balances because that's a low level we, we trust that anybody looking at your phone maybe that's okay but you go to transfer money now you're going to need a you know some type of biometric some type of proof of life or, uh, you know, or maybe it is just, you know, uh, not, you know, we don't have enough trust in that uh, device. And we're going to say, hey, we need you to go into a branch or call in. And that's why, you know, we, we this is, and so that when you talk about challenges to getting stuff rolled out, is that in general, you've got, if you are a technology provider, you've got to look at your audience. 
And if you are uh, on GitHub and you're delivering code, you're talking to technology people and you can hit the most advanced stuff and be talking about the most recent stuff. But, you know, for the rest of us, we have to, you know, balance that out and be able to, you know, get to the point where let, let Amazon deal with the passkey thing when they've got, you know, uh, you know and, and try to figure out what that means while that, uh, while the rest of us can then, you know, piggyback on the back of it and say, all right, now more people know enough to where we can start releasing some of this technology out so that everybody can benefit. Yeah, I think that 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 journey uh, that you took us on actually that helps to explain a lot of what we've seen in um, consumer account security over the last decade or so. I always thought it was great that you know I could go on Steam, I could set up secure two-factor authentication to lock down my copy of Goat Simulator, uh, and I always thought it was really weird that I couldn't do anything like that with my bank. I, I get that all the time. Like, yeah, I can secure my Steam account with Authenticator. Why can't I do it with my bank? And and it is a great question. And, and it's because we've got some really expensive technology on the back end that does a lot of that for you. You know, we 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 have you know all sorts of telemetry uh, when you log in through the web or through the mobile uh, that says you know, hey, we we we're you know more confident that this is uh, allowed than than before. But I, I want to also highlight the point you made earlier about looking at your audience. And this is something that's, that's really important. And in the research world, uh, uh, an area of research that has become more and more and more important in the last 10 years is what's called usable security. And it's this idea that we should think about uh, our uh, research and user interfaces, and we should also apply that to security. Because it turns out that security that is really, really good and you know it really, really stops the bad guys when us experts use it, and then we give it to even a, a competent user and they go, Fumble and now it's less secure. Well, it's actually less secure technology, mm -hmm. even if the math says it's more secure, right? Yeah. Um, and this is a process that takes a lot of time to build up. How do you actually present this well so that a user can understand it? Uh, I'm not exactly sure where we are on that on passkey. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody knows exactly where we are on that. I, I said, and from a consumer perspective. The Amazon, they are starting to, to roll it up. I'm right? very surprised to hear that. I, I love to hear that. I would. Um, and, you know, these things, uh, often we don't know until we try to roll it out to customers and see how customers react. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, would, I would totally agree with that. I've always loved the maxim that um, security that comes at the expense of usability also comes at the expense of security. Uh, and, and it's not just the, you know, the super smart security wizards like these guys uh who uh or, or i should say you know e even even us on this panel right if we make things too secure eventually we're going to get lazy we're going to get frustrated we're going to look for an easier way to do it we're going to take shortcuts and that's going to uh that's going to let uh let insecurity in around the edges and if we find things that work well for everyone then that raises the bar and keeps all of us more secure. Um, now, one thing you mentioned a moment ago was biometrics, and I think that's worth touching on. Uh, is any of that communicated back to the site you're logging into, or are there any other privacy concerns we might want to talk about with pass keys? That's yeah, it's a great question because uh, you know we you know, when we rolled out biometric at, at my company that you know, we got out in front of that one really quick right <laughs> so uh, the way biometrics work and and any any of them whether it's face uh, thumb or or any of the palm or however fancy you want to get you know is is basically to um, you know look at the attributes of whatever the face or the hand uh, and and there's there's two aspects to it there is proof of life right is making you know how do you make sure that the thing is real. All right, and and so uh, with the uh, thumb scans and the thumbprints, uh, it is you know there's a temperature uh, sensor along with the uh, the, the the reader. Um, then then it is looking and it basically uh, you know does magic math again, and and looks at it and then stores that as a secret. So I'm basically you take your thumbprint, magic math that is part of you know it's part of your device. Your device comes up with the magic math, so that magic math is only on your device. And then the you know go through this algorithm, and then that that result gets stored in your TPM. It's like a key. So when I swipe, it goes back through the the algorithm, and and says yes, this is the thing that I calculated before, 
and says, yes, I can then unlock the thing that you're looking for. And that is the uh, that is in you know, FIDO2 and, and the TPM uh, specification is, is how to then access the keys inside. Uh, so yes, the, the answer to, to make sure, you know, say lots of words there, but to make it clear, uh, no, uh, none of your biometrics is stored in a database anywhere. Uh, and, and in most cases, <laughs> I was like, anyway, uh, but you know, in, 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 uh, in, in that is all, uh, device local and does not get transmitted. Great. Uh, looks like we have an audience question. Hello. There you go. Hello guys. How you doing? Xavier, I work with you at Microsoft. How you doing? Star G and Andy. Um, so here's the thing, right? Have a uh, Fido was the greatest thing ever. Right. I don't know how passwords last this long. It was amazing. I really don't know. Right. But we know that it's not even secure anymore. Right. It's like our social security number. But um, but with with passless is saying that regardless of all this stuff that could be in inter uh, uh, intercepted, uh, hackers could send out fake uh, uh, tokens and through SMS and all that stuff, right? They could call you up and say, give me the number. With passless, they can't. All that is gone. So the the thing I'm wondering, right, when when at Microsoft we go out to clients to try to encourage them, mm -hmm. you know, to turn this on, to turn Windows Hello on and all this on, is, you know, I think of the commercial Mikey, right? I don't know if y'all remember that where where there was a cereal no one wanted to eat. There was it's, it's a table of kids. No one wanted to eat it, so they gave it to Mikey. <laughs> and Mikey ate it, and they're like, oh, that's cool. And everybody started eating it. Who is the Mikey? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is it the consumers? Is it, you know, is it the uh, corporate? Like, who is going to be that one that everybody says, oh, that's a cool thing? Yeah, I think that the... Uh, the, so the selling factor and both the consumer and the enterprise space is is the same for me. And because I had mm -hmm. to sell this internally as well, you don't have to put your password when you lock on. You can walk on, walk up to your machine, you don't have to put your password in. That is such a small thing, right? I I, I know my password pretty well to my my machine, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 even if I can get down to a pin, right? That's just a huge. Everybody thinks that that's so huge. So that's the carrot. Even though that, like you said, this is it's a it all the technology below it is pretty damn amazing. Right. And if I go into why oh it's you know fishless, pyto, proof of life, all these things, you know, people I, mean, I don't care about that. But hey, you say hey, but when you walk up to your machine, it just unlocks. It sees your face and knows it, and it just unlocks. People are like Whoa. so. There's your right. there's your Mikey. That that's that is the the you know is get that in there, and that is the because you have to enable that foundation to get to the just the fancy unlock when you walk up. But now, if the, if you can that, like you said, extend that to the things that you're trying to make fish proof, right? Uh, then then yeah, you're there. So that, but but also you mentioned with facial that you know I could I could um, kind of hack that, right? Somehow you, you, you can with also so, so that's what that's where you know. In fact, with Microsoft Hello, there was a famous paper showing that yes, uh, you could print out people's. That. Faces yeah. that wear to the mask and log into their computers. Yeah, right, which was right. a problem, as you can imagine. Yeah, the, the original you know, when it started rolling out, and that's where the um, and 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 so enterprise, you know, you get to set the level of of trust, right? And of course, being a bank, we we're insisting that you have to have the IR camera, and so it won't even right. work on that. Uh, but it's it's entry level. It's, it's getting into this place, mm -hmm. right? It's like yes, it's not super secure, uh, and that you know your kids might be able to you know print out a picture of mom to hack her hack her phone, yeah. right? And, yeah. and and a lot of people's threat model. I always ask them, you know, what's your threat model? Are you is it your kids or is it your your company? Is inside it the government? Inside a threat. Uh huh. Do what? Your kids inside a threat. Inside a threat, right? You know, is is uh, and because everybody thinks about it because because that's you know. Uh, yeah, kids, well, oh, Russian unlocking your phone, gonna, buying all the stuff on Amazon. Well, Russian fishers don't know your face, yeah. right. so you know this. This is, this is still helpful against that threat model. Exactly. exactly. So this is where, what is more secure versus less secure is, you know, I think often, even in EFF panels, I often hear uh, what sounds like a, a global standard of security where there's just more or less secure and less secure, mm. and this is just not true. And this is a really good example. Yeah. yeah. But but passless. Okay. Let, let's say I get through all that. I get your fingerprint. I get your your face. Yeah, I still have to get your phone to click on the app. 
So that, so that's the, so that yeah that that's the proof of life, and that is so implementing the full FIDO two does require that, right? And and that is again up to your app and your enterprise and figuring out what that is, and it could be just the logging onto your machine. But you know, and when you want to then transfer funds, you might want to then uh, you know push you know uh, push something to the phone. So yeah, and just uh, just one clarification there: if you're a consumer, if you're using something like Amazon, it's not there yet. We're we're moving toward uh, full passwordless. Uh, the the industry hopes that someday we'll be able to use only some version of pass keys or or a subsequent technology, um, but you will still have. For example, an Amazon username and password, uh, which does mean that even if you set up a pass key, uh, the fisher somewhere else in the world can uh, can trick you into putting them into a fake login form. It's just that yeah, your, your pass, pass key won't work. There. Yeah, pass keys are not the fix for everything. It fixes mm -hmm. a lot of things, but there's always the back door mm -hmm. uh, and the side door. And side and, door. And all right. Um, All right. So, yeah. Next question, please. Uh, Zebra, you you mentioned the problem, uh, like the bank problem, where you're slow to roll out the ability for users to like use different types of MFA. Um, but I wanted to ask about a parallel problem, which is to disallow the use of less secure methods. So, like you know, my bank will finally allow me to use like um, an authenticator app, but it won't let me disallow the use of SMS. And in a situation where you're only as strong as your weakest link. Mm -hmm. You know, do you think pass keys could eventually help bridge that gap where you could like disallow the use of a password on your bank account? Or is this are you think this is still going to fall into a similar trap as like the traditional MFA route? Yeah, I mean, again, SMS, you know, and phone swapping, you know, where where is that happening the most? right now right and generally that's where you're at your high risk stuff of doing uh bitcoin and you know that that's where people steal most you know do most of the sim swapping is to steal money from that area well you don't see too many sim swaps just to get into a bank account because because of the or u.s bank account because we've got so many federal protections that even if you were even if i were to write you know hand, tell you all my password right now you could all go transfer all the money out of my account Tomorrow, you know, or back in Monday when, or Tuesday when the bank's open, right? I can call them up and say, I was at Dragon Con, got really drunk, and I gave everybody my password. Uh, can you give me my money back? And as long as it's less than 10, uh, you know, federal protection, you, you can get that. And so that's why we, we have a little bit more flexibility. It's not just about the front door. And so we, yeah, and so yes, there, there's always going to be that, um, at, at least in banking. Now you switch to something like, you know, Bitcoin or some of the other fintech apps like Cash App, things like that. There's no protections there. So the front door is the only thing. If they still, you know, if you give you your Venmo uh, username and password, it's gone. There's no getting it back. So in those, you have to you know, then think about, you know, you've got it. And, and most fintechs do. And that's what's, you know, if you go and look at those, they, they've they got all of the, the fancy things because they know they can't uh, rewind transactions. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Sorry, I missed it. What was that password again? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, I am a uh, level three escalations engineer for a zero knowledge, zero trust password management company. All right. And we also dipped our toes into privileged access management. So you're um, going to let us know all the things we said wrong? Yeah. All right. Um, no, uh, it, it was just kind of interesting where the focus is from an academic standpoint. You know, to me, uh, kind of the bigger focus with security is. Uh, I would say, you know, 70% of the sysadmins I deal with on a daily basis can't integrate SSO with 365. They can't spin up a Docker container. They've never touched a Linux terminal in their life. Right. And they call me up to do it for them, right? <laughs> um, you know, it, getting them to even implement a form of 2FA in the first place is a challenge. Would it serve better to possibly put more emphasis on better hiring practices from the, from the, from the jump rather than hire these know nothing guys who failed upwards for 15 years. Cause they learned <laughs> on-premise AD in 2002. I, I have bad news for you about how we're training, uh, 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 IT people. I mean, I literally was having a conversation with a colleague at another university, uh, who recently found out that despite, uh, and, uh, in addition to the CS department where he works, there is an IT department where they never touch a Linux terminal. Mm -hmm. They don't touch any code. Well, most CS majors don't uh, touch Linux anyway. They right. are required to at my university. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, they SSH into a box once, type in CD, LS, and CAT. They have to and do a bit more done. than that. But the, 
I, I, I hear what you're saying. We don't enforce it as much as we, we could and maybe should. So I guess another interesting point with the, because we implemented pass keys and when it came out, I was like, oh, what's this? So I went and read all the you know white papers and such on it. Um, why not just stick with biometrics? You know, if you if you have to use two fingerprints, right? That consumers can understand that. You know, you you, you expect them to read something about a this thing called a pass key, and it lives on the device, and it you know gets you into Amazon or ADP or whatever. You know, why not make it a little more simple and just say, you know, finger one, finger you 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 have ten good passwords on each hand or five on each hand. You know, <laughs> so I, I was it's, there's there's. It comes down to the full ecosystem of it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just about unlocking the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So then uh, how does, you know, what, what what is actually being scanned and then what is being, what is the actual lock? And are you transmitting that to a central system to unlock and get it back? Mm -hmm. Then could you steal that? Could you replay it? Could you, you know, and so then if I were to then, you know, steal that on the wire or steal that in the system, mm -hmm. could you, and then if I do steal it, how do I reset my fingerprint? Uh -huh. Run it, run it through. Uh, so the way we do zero knowledge, zero trust is if you log in with a master password, it basically iterates over that a thousand or ten thousand times, right. and then at the end is completely randomized, right? Right, and that's in general what the the TPM module of being able to unlock the TPM with biometrics is that that is allows for a local interaction mm -hmm. to then uh, get to a trusted module. So then you're just unlocking another layer of trust mm -hmm. so that you can then decide maybe there's some things that you can just do a fingerprint on, right? My phone, just getting to my phone and puts the thumbprint, I'm in, right? That's good enough. But then when I want to do you know, something more, it's going to then proof of life. It's going to you know, ask for a code. So it, 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 it's, it's not saying there's just one solution to solve them all. Mm -hmm. Figuring out a model that, that fits all of these different tr uh, trust situations and applying them and then also thinking about the full life cycle of that trust and that secret is where we get into the complexities. And, that, and, that, and that's, that's, that's where I think where we're going. And I, I think that's actually a, a great way to, uh, to situate pass keys and, and how they will help or can help uh, regular consumers is... You, you use your, your fingerprint or your face to unlock your phone or your laptop. The pass key is the piece that bridges from that unlock to the website that you're trying to get into. There you go. Speaking of the Windows Hello, I believe it's still vulnerable if you take an image of someone and project an image onto the bust of a of a dummy. Nice. Nice. I mean, I'm not going to claim to Microsoft to implement it. It's the correct yeah, answer. Again, I, <laughs> well, I, 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 don't, I don't think you should take any of us to say that there's a yeah, perfect yeah. implementation I'm, out there. I'm no cryptography expert, but, but to me, it just seems like, okay, left hand thumb, okay, right hand thumb, and then you're in, right? Because. It, but the thing about fingerprints uh, is that anybody that's old like me mm -hmm. and that had a. Uh, a I know, I know where you go. Yeah, is, My is, grandmother is, has no fingerprints. Well, no, it is that, and, and got a clearance at any point and with the mm -hmm. government, mm -hmm. uh, that has been stolen several times by the Chinese, right? So the, 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 you know, several governments have a lot of my biometric information. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, we've got to, we've got to consider those things. Mm -hmm. And again, you can't reset your, 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 your fingerprints. And, and and they've already been stolen. And I guess, in, uh, you know, I used to work in digital banking as well. Uh, uh, I did integrations uh, at a company here in Atlanta, you know, small town bank. It's a middleware system, hooks in their back end, and now they have a website and a mobile app instantly. Uh, when I left there two and a half years ago, they still had no, you know, it was SMS 2FA. Why is there no governmental, you know, or, or, or is EFF like pursuing anything like that to kind of say, hey, maybe there should be some government regulation requiring banks to have some sort of influence on 2FA practices and I, again I, I, it doesn't it doesn't affect our risk model that much because we have protections of being able to roll back the transaction so even if you get an account takeover it is not the end of the world that's what we're saying that's true with US banking mm -hmm. and that's not true with all the other technologies that you use password and so that that particular use case is you know we, we're we've got the undo button so I do want to make sure we have time for the, the other questions in line, but but just to, to follow up on the question about what EFF is doing. Uh, again, I'm not the expert on that. I don't work on our legislative team. I do know that that uh, that topic overall about corporate uh, consumer facing security, that's something that Senator Ron Wyden's office works on pretty often. So uh, that would be a, a great place to uh, to start your research. Hey. Uh, you mentioned uh, just a second ago, like 
having a clearance. Have you encountered pushback from certain organizations, uh, maybe in the federal sector, where they allow absolutely no personal electronic devices? Uh, that's a fun one, trying to get in and ask us. My 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 best skiff story is where uh, there was a one one door. Uh, it says you know you you go into the skiff and there's one way and they say make sure you go left. And so I looked right and there's the uh, like all the signs the symbols that tell you that you're going to die in multiple different ways. Yeah, it was a you know, it was a super fun site. So there's where all the poisons is, and then I'm going to go that way that way. It was hilarious. Um, it, it, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, governments tend to, you know, uh, rely on old, but tr true technology and are not, uh, on the, on the leading edge. Uh, and so, uh, being able to implement that level of technology, uh, you know, it requires, you know, we, we talk about like, convincing consumers, right? The consumers generally are not very technical savvy, you know, the government, they're even less technical savvy. Right. And so that, that's where the curve is. Is that you? You know, we've got inter, you've got you know leading edge, bleeding edge, then you've got consumers, enterprise, and then you know government is way down the tail end. And so I think it's just going to take some time and and uh, you know adoption and showing that you know this is not like uh, RSA, right? You know, we got the RSA was used by the government and we we got burned, right? <laughs> you you probably were involved with that. So you know it's it's it, and so that's that's really fresh on people's minds. Like hey. If we just make people physically show up and we look at them with an M16 and we, you know, we allow them in, then we'll say it's secure. Uh, we won't use this newfangled technology. So I think it's just going to take some time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think this might be a last, well, it's time for the last question. So. Hey, so as uh, the unpaid resident IT for all of my family and extended family, mm -hmm. pass keys, uh, you know, I can't fish them from my own family. So what infrastructure do you all see that would help me, you know, with grandma across the country when she set up her account with Paskey and now doesn't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so th this is one that I, I've actually been thinking about a lot. I, so yep. I, I do have a, uh, a family member with dementia and th this goes both ways, right? Because I, I've got the back door into her Gmail account. Um, but also next time I visit her, I can set up a pass key for that Gmail account so that she can log in without resetting it and spamming me with authentication codes every time. Uh, so uh, this comes back to what we were saying before, where uh, pass keys don't immediately and likely not, to be totally honest, anytime very soon, get us to the full passwordless future. Um, there are still going to be alternate methods into any consumer account. And that that's probably going to look pretty similar to how it looks today for major services like Google and Amazon. Similar to how, what would happen if you lost your passkey, but also this might be a use for that or passkey I was talking about earlier, where you might have your passkey into your grandma's account, she might have hers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they, yeah in, in the, the multi, uh, multi access, right? You know, kids, family members, you know, that that's a real use case that needs you know, to be worked out and talked with, you know, by your, by your family. Because if the only way that to get into an account is through that old computer, that's barely, you know, it's got all <laughs> the, 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 the dirt and stuff clogging it up, it's going to die any minute now. So you, you, you want you want to think through all of those use cases. Thanks, gentlemen. All right. All right. Thanks so much for coming out and listening to us all talk about pass keys for an hour. Uh, please uh, don't forget, you can leave us feedback on the DragonCon app, uh, if, especially if you enjoyed it. But, you know, if you, if you thought that this moderator didn't know what he was talking about, I'm sure they could use that <laughs> feedback too. Give us some feedback. Thank you very Thanks much. Everyone. Thank you.